building Christian social networks. Any one group would be able to quickly communicate to any person the wide spectrum of Christian ministries to offer a more fulsome response to those with whom we have contact. On the feature today, excerpts from a speech delivered to an AGM of the Oxford ARPA chapter in Ontario on ways for Christians to work together in the public sphere. In the news, some new hints this week on Ottawa's thinking about the euthanasia file. Alberta introduces new legislation on transgenderism, some historical perspective on the outcome of Quebec's Charbonneau Commission on Public Corruption, and David Suzuki likens the energy industry to slavery in the American South. And now, Lighthouse News. Lighthouse News is a presentation of ARPA, the Association for Reform Political Action. Here's your host, Al Sebring. We saw a glimmer of hope last week in terms of the federal government's thinking on the euthanasia file. Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould told a Montreal newspaper that she'd like the Quebec government to delay implementation of its new law on euthanasia until Ottawa formalizes its response to the Carter decision. The new Quebec law is supposed to take effect December 10th, but Wilson-Raybould says that they'd like to avoid any uncertainty in the approach to medical aid in dying by having the federal legislative framework implemented before the Quebec law takes effect. Because of that, she says she'd like to see Quebec delay the actual implementation of its new law. There's no indication Ottawa will actually move in any substantive way to force Quebec to hold off with, for example, some kind of court challenge. There is a separate challenge before the courts launched by a Quebec doctors group with the support of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. We could get a ruling on that court challenge sometime this week. In Alberta, the Notley government has introduced a new bill to protect so-called transgender rights. Jack Fonseca with the pro-family organization Campaign Life Coalition says this is more evidence of the kind of activism that's becoming pervasive in Canadian politics. Most people, he says, understand that bills like this, which would allow men who claim gender confusion access to women's bathrooms or change rooms, are not a good idea. But he says a lot of politicians have a different take on this. Regular folks who simply want to protect their children and want a good life and you know they respect everybody, they have reasonable views. They see the world as it really is. So average folks, average Albertans, they are sane people. But they have lives, they have jobs, and most often normal folks, and especially Christians, don't aspire to power. They're happy just doing their jobs or whatever. The people who aspire to political power very often are activists. They are not Christians, they are not people of faith, and they are of the left-wing liberal variety, regardless of the party, and they are open to all of these kind of sexual agendas. He says there's added pressure on those politicians from the media to implement this kind of legislation, but he says experience shows these kinds of laws are simply not a good idea. University of Toronto implemented a bathroom bill. They set up all these unisex bathrooms to allow transsexual and transgendered people to use it. And quite immediately, guys and boys who were looking for loopholes, they started to go into these showers where girls were showering, putting their cell phones over the shower stall and videotaping these naked girls. You know, it became such a problem, the school had to shut down some of these transgender bathrooms because of the abuse. So this is the kind of lunacy that society lends itself to when we follow these crazy demands of radical activists. The bill has passed first reading, and it had support across the political spectrum, including from the opposition Wild Rose Party. In Quebec, a four-year-long investigation into corruption in the construction industry, especially as it affected the building of public works projects like roads and bridges, is now wrapped up. The report provides a litany of examples of fraud, collusion, and other shady practices which drove the cost of those construction projects through the roof, with the extra money being pocketed by political lobbyists, industry insiders, and politicians. Christian scholar John Stackhouse at Crandall University in Moncton, New Brunswick, says the report is stunning in its scope. I think that this shows a kind of deep moral malaise that so very many people could have been involved in this without a whistle being blown before and without honorable people in positions of power stepping in to say no. And you wonder, are there so many people in power in Quebec that can get into those positions and protect each other that uh, when you move the rock, there are some awfully big and very many bugs that crawl out.
So it's difficult to know what to say, except that clearly what is the governing ideology of these people, which seems to be simply rampant selfishness, is not serving the people of Quebec very well. There's a telling quote in that report. I'll read it. It is only collectively that we will succeed in making Quebec a better society where ethics, integrity, honesty, and rigor come first. The question I asked Dr. Stackhouse is, given that Quebec has moved away from an expressly Catholic social order to becoming one of the most expressly secular societies in North America, how can things like integrity and honor and ethics be maintained as a sociological base? He says the answer is complicated. It's tricky to know from a dispassionate historian's point of view because what we really don't know is just what the Duplessis government got up to with the Roman Catholic Church back in the 40s and 50s and just how cozy that relationship was in terms of favors and back scratching and so on that may or may not have taken the form of actual money changing hands. But that was a relationship that the people of Quebec decided was something they needed to forcefully get rid of and they certainly did. And my sense is you look at history, sometimes cultures can be officially quite religious, like Renaissance Italy, and you've got the Borgias who are corrupting things right up to papacy itself. So it's tricky to know whether things are really worse in Quebec than they were before. But whatever's going on, there's something deeply troubling about this widespread corruption. The report makes nine recommendations to clean things up. And finally, David Suzuki's back in the news. The environmental activist made a shocking claim last week in an interview on Evan Solomon's podcast where he equated those who are defending Canada's energy industry to those who were defending slavery in the American South more than 100 years ago. The southern states argued in the 19th century that to eliminate slavery would destroy their economy. It did. It transformed their economy. But who would say today that the economy should have come before slavery. Suzuki did later clarify he didn't mean to be attacking those working in the industry, but the underlying assumptions of his statement are not going over well with some people. Dr. Cal Beisner with the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation says the energy industry has been a net positive for society in all kinds of ways. Abundant, affordable, reliable energy from fossil fuels has lifted billions of people in the developed world out of poverty and the high rates of disease and premature death that invariably accompany it. It's done that at a cost of a few minutes a day of labor for the typical household. And the result has been a reduction in infant and child mortality rates from nearly 50% to under 1%, and an increase in life expectancy from under 30 years to nearly 80. Now, try comparing that with the situation of the average sub-Saharan African household. There, the average woman spends six to eight hours a day just gathering wood and dung which she uses as her primary cooking and heating fuels, smoke from which kills two to four million people a year, most of them women, young children. It causes upper respiratory diseases and eye infections in hundreds of millions of other people every year, diminishing their capacity to work and conquer poverty. Meisner says Suzuki's statement about slavery really gets things backwards. Suzuki may not want it, but the real consequence of the policies he wants is to trap the world's poorest in their poverty and hunger and disease and premature death, and to push those in lower income brackets in developed countries back into grinding poverty. If Suzuki is looking for something to compare with slavery, well, (laughs) the policies he wants are a far better analogy than fossil fuels. Back with more after this. ARPA has a job opening for a web developer and e-activist. The successful candidate will be responsible for managing our websites and IT, as well as developing new tools for our supporters to be an effective salt and light. The full job description is available at arpacanada.ca. To apply, please submit a resume, cover letter, and references to Executive Director Mark Penninga at mark at arpacanada.ca. And we're back on the program. On the feature today, some excerpts from a speech given at the annual meeting of ARPA's Oxford chapter in Mount Elgin, Ontario, earlier this month. The full speech ran over half an hour. We've got a link to it in its entirety from the Lighthouse News homepage. For the purposes of the program this week, just a few minutes of that speech. It was delivered by Rev. David Lipsy of the Heritage Reformed Church in Burgessville, Ontario. His theme was Building Christian Networks, and he started out 
with a reference to evangelism. If I would say the word evangelism, typically we might think of an individual approaching someone else and presenting the gospel. But when we think about the ministry of the Lord Jesus, is that all he did? Did he simply present the gospel to everyone and that was the extent of his ministry? I think all of us recognize that there was more to what he did. Now, if you take that picture of what we typically call evangelism, imagine that same person being surrounded, being fortified by others. Let's just say that person who I'm approaching with the gospel uh, is in need of affordable housing. Or let's just say they lack employment. Or maybe they're clueless when it comes to finances. I don't think any of us would expect one individual to possess the gifts and understanding to provide all that that person might need. Wouldn't it be encouraging for that person doing the evangelism to be surrounded by, backed up by, a number of individuals with whom he could connect that person so that he not only receives the gospel, but also necessary information from Christians to enable that person to live a wholesome life. Could you imagine the witness to our culture if these ministries, as diverse as they may be in their mandate and in their work, would begin to link together so that you have the supporting churches working in cooperation with groups like ARPA, CCBR, We Need a Law, crisis pregnancy centers, youth centers, so that any one group would be able to quickly communicate to any person the wide spectrum of Christian ministries to offer a more fulsome response to those with whom we have contact. Could you imagine the impression that would be on a person all of a sudden realizing that so many of these organizations who minister to people in so many different ways actually collaborate together. They would then no longer see the face of a church, of an organization, but they would begin to see a little more clearly the body of Christ as a whole, a united front in these specific ways. We're not talking about grandiose ecumenicism. We're talking about each member of the larger body using the gifts and areas of expertise God has blessed them with together. Now, what are the practical implications on a large scale? I could just imagine you sitting there, you are a worn out, just re-elected ARPA board member thinking, I am so busy as it is. I can't imagine even beginning to do anything like what's being suggested. Well, may I suggest the first place we begin is prayer, but not our prayers. The prayer of the Lord Jesus in John 17, particularly these words, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The world knows nothing, quite frankly, of our unity as Christians in the invisible church. But what can they see? They can see visible manifestations of that invisible unity. And isn't it remarkable that Jesus says, the world seeing such manifestations of unity will be led to believe that the Father has sent the Son. Who would have ever connected those two things? Now the converse is true too. If the world sees division and lack of collaboration, why would it believe that the Father sent the Son to preside over a hopelessly divided house? Again, a full copy of Reverend Lipsy's speech is on the ARPA website. We've got a link to it from the Lighthouse News homepage. This has been Lighthouse News, delivering news and commentaries on today's current events to equip Christians for their task in the public square. Questions or feedback? 
You can leave us an audio comment by clicking on the Answering Machine button at the top of the Lighthouse News homepage. Or you can send us an email, info at arpacanada.ca. Be sure to join us again next week for another edition of Lighthouse News.